Amen. Good morning. Hey, have you noticed that it is a great time to be a sports fan in Colorado? So the, the, the Rockies are full of promise. The Avalanche made the playoffs. The, the Broncos are retooling again. <laughs> but there's optimism there. Um, but the Nuggets made the playoffs. Come on, for the first time in five years. And, and this is exciting. We're a basketball family. We've followed the Nuggets through the, the, the old days, the thug days, the, the Mello and Iverson, how's that going to work days, a lot of offense, a little bit of defense, uh, then the down days, and then the next down days. And so now they've rebuilt, they've homegrown, they haven't cut corners, and they made the playoffs and won their division. Super exciting, right? Um, and... Where they are now is, is of particular interest to me. It's fascinating to watch because what happens when you get to this point, the last couple weeks of the NBA season, is that the teams sort of bifurcate. You get two paths. The teams that didn't make the playoffs and um, th their season's effectively over, they start, you know, like... Um, if LeBron James gets a hangnail, then they shut him down for the season, just for precautionary reasons. And then they play their young prospects, partly to see what they've got and, you know, where they're not, there's not as much jeopardy if they lose the game, but partly to, in fact, lose the game in a dignified way. Because the more you lose, if you're not going to win, the better draft pick you get. And so um, that's happening on this side of the aisle. And on that side of the aisle, you've got the teams that are strategizing how to play and how to uh, retool and dial in and focus in order to maximize their postseason success. And that, of course, is where many of the teams, to include our beloved Nuggets, find themselves. But where they are, in any case, going down to the wire, there's three games left in the regular season, it's crunch time, right? And that's where Jesus was at this exact time relative to the Easter season. It's crunch time, right? We call it passion tide, and that's a word that comes from the tradition in the church calendar where tide simply means time or season, you know, like Advent tide. And then passion refers to the last week of Jesus' life and his sufferings, trials, and, and death on the cross. Well, Passion Tide, technically, according to the high church calendar, is I think the last two weeks of Lent, right? Where we find ourselves and the lead up, the ramp to Jesus' holy week. Well, Next Sunday, as you heard Pastor George tell you, we have a very special service, which every year we take to devote to experiencing Jesus' suffering and trials as he walked through Jerusalem to the cross. Now we're on the final approach, the week before the week before his death. Mark chapter 10 tells us they were now on the way up to Jerusalem. Who's they? That's Jesus and his disciples. Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Disciples full of awe because Jesus was finally coming into the culmination of his glory and destiny. The others full of fear because they're going into the belly of the beast, and they see the way those people treat dissenters. Taking the twelve aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. It is his approach to Jerusalem. It's the beginning of the end. It's crunch time, if you will. And in the same way that perhaps you might find an NBA team shortening their rotation, dialing in their playbook, and focusing all their energy on the culminating event and winning a championship, here you see Jesus focusing on his mission as it culminates in just a couple weeks. Passion Tide is central in its significance, theologically and practically, to our experience of Christian faith. Counterintuitively, though, it's a time less conducive to what we do often when we look at the Word of God, which is analyzing, interpreting, and then applying, trying to understand and put into practice. Right? Last month, for example, we studied through the book of Daniel and we looked at what it says to us with regard to our own vocation, to our work and its significance to God's purposes. But not so much in Passion Tide. In this time, the message is the point. 
experiencing Jesus' road to the cross, walking with him, as the Apostle Paul write, no, wrote, knowing this love that surpasses knowledge. That's our aim, to experience that which you can't know from a book and in a classroom. And so the application is simple. Will you walk with Jesus all the way to the cross? This morning we're in crunch time, and we're looking at Jesus' approach His last couple of weeks before he enters Jerusalem, the scriptures say he turns his focus resolutely toward the holy city. He knows what's coming, and he's dialed in. We're going to look at it from three vantage points. The first is the Gospel of Mark. As we started, the story picks up. If you'll skip down to verse 46, they reached Jericho, which is a suburb of Jerusalem, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, which is son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted the louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, I'm sorry, but this is crunch time and I got to stay focused. Like, that's probably what I would have said. But Jesus said, hey, tell him to come here. Now, his handlers, his entourage are probably like, Jesus, hey, focus, we're going to Jerusalem. They're trying to keep people away from him. But he says, no, 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 come here. And he asks the man, what do you want me to do for you? Well, I'm not so much looking to analyze this story and break it down and see what Bartimaeus and his interaction with Jesus means for us as to look at what it means on the broadest scale. Here you have a man who, by the social order of Jesus' day, was at the bottom of the social totem pole. He was a low-class guy, and he's making a scene. To Jesus' followers and to sensible religious people who read the events of these days, his involvement in the scene, his thrusting himself in the middle was obtuse and off point. He was unwelcome in every way. Our title this morning is The Unwelcome. Look over in the Gospel of John. This is a second Gospel writer and companion to Jesus. And through the lens of his attention, we see another episode. Jesus entered Sorry, wrong passage, John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany. That's another suburb of Jerusalem. The home of Lazarus, who was the man he had recently raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Martha was one of Lazarus' sister. The other was Mary. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. And she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But one of Jesus' companions, Judas Iscariot, the disciple, of course, who would soon betray him, though none of them knew that at that time, save for Jesus, said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared about the poor. He was a thief, and since he was in charge of the money, he stole some for himself. But Jesus replied, hey, leave her alone, and comes to the woman's defense. So here you have two episodes in crunch time, both in the last week or two of Jesus' life, on the approach, the final approach to Jerusalem. Two characters who were off script, two people who were low on the social order, outcasts, in their own right, both making a scene. So you have the low-class man foisting himself in front of Jesus, and now you have a chemically imbalanced woman doing highly objectionable things, or at least so it must have seemed to the disciples. And you're like, oh, it's probably cultural context. No, dumping perfume on someone's feet in the middle of a meal was weird then too, right? And they're like, what are you doing? And then one of them speaks up and he's like, hey, we're in crunch time. Every dollar counts. We can't just be wasting money willy-nilly at Starbucks. This, but this stuff could have been sold. We got bills to pay. We got kingdom to advance. What are you doing? But Jesus got in his face too. Luke 19, third gospel author, third vantage point on this critical crunch time approach. 
Jesus entered Jericho, so probably didn't go back to Jericho. This is probably two different events on the same stop in the town of Jericho on the way into Jerusalem. He made his way through the town, and there was a man there named Zacchaeus. Luke is the only gospel author to tell us of Zacchaeus. Perhaps Zacchaeus' story didn't make it on the other's radar screen. Maybe they weren't there. Who knows? But he saw fit to include this story. He was a chief tax collector in the region and had become very rich. Why was he rich? Because he was extorting money from the people, right? Tax collectors weren't just highly paid citizens. He was collecting the money due Rome and then adding some onto the top and keeping, for, keeping him for himself. It was just good old-fashioned third-world graft, right? He was just doing it there in plain sight, and the people hated him for it. So it was like Bernie Madoff, but he hadn't gotten caught. And so a whole bunch of people were like, you keep taking our money. We don't like you. So that's what was happening with Zacchaeus. Well, he wanted to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see, so he ran ahead and climbed a tree beside the road for Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Well, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. Of course the people were displeased. He had gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. So you have the socially awkward, low-class man foisting himself on the scene. You have a chemically imbalanced woman doing highly objectionable things. And now you have a hated sellout impertinently pushing his way in. He didn't have any business with Jesus. He's been undermining everything that we've come to believe Jesus stands for. What do all three of these encounters have in common? All three were outsiders. They all caused consternation among the